so much for today, your Sabbath day, your special day of worship. Thank you for this church and the fellowship and community that it provides. Be with us right now as we open your word. Guide us. May I speak the words that you once spoken. Amen. What did you want to be when you were a child? Turn to the person next to you and discuss that question for the next 10 seconds. What have we come up with? Have we got anything that took you by surprise? Natalie is gesticulating. Someone is cowering away. I think we want to hear that one. A helicopter pilot, very good. Anything else that you care to share? Batman. Batman. I think we all want to be Batman at one stage. I don't know why, but the earliest career path that caught my desire was that of a garbage collector. I must have been three or four years of age. I distinctly remember peering through the front window of our then family home and waiting in anticipation of the garbage trucks arriving on those early morning visits. Looking back, I'm not sure why I wanted to be a garbage collector. It was probably the thought of driving the trucks. Whilst I'm often told by the females in my life that the cars that I drive are garbage, <laughs> my plans of becoming a garbage collector haven't come to fruition. I think one of the coolest things about God is that even when we don't know our future, He does. God tells us in Jeremiah 1 verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Whether we acknowledge it or not, each one of us has desires, goals, a bucket list, New Year's resolutions, a life plan. I know that plans are rampant in your life. You are not alone in charting a course for your life. A Google search of the term life plan delivers 486 million hits. As Christians, the only plan that really matters is the plan divinely designed for each one of us by the one who formed us. The one who loves us, knows everything about us, and set us apart to be his own. That plan is God's will and purpose for each one of our lives. Psalm 138 contains a verse that absolutely thrilled me the first time I read it. And today, all these years later, I'm still enthusiastic about this verse, and in particular, verse 8. Here's what it says in the New Living Translation. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. In times of doubt, this verse of scripture, in fact the whole chapter, uh, has offered me comfort and assurance. It reminds me that I don't have to bear the burden of making every good thing happen in my life. Jesus will work out his plans for me. Today we will discuss how this truth works itself out in our lives. But first, being a lawyer, here's the disclaimer. The fact that God has a plan for our lives doesn't mean we are to live without ambition or without any direction in life. Did you get that? We're not to live without ambition or direction in life. It doesn't mean that we're to wander aimlessly day to day, waiting on God to initiate a fulfilling life. We need to be diligent. The true corollary of God's promise in Psalm 138 verse 8 is this. If we strive to live according to God's will, we have the assurance that he is working on our behalf, behind the scenes so to speak, pulling strings to ensure that things happen according to his plan. We are assured in Proverbs 21 verse 5, that the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. We are also assured in Psalm 1611, God will show us the way of life. Being with him is to be full of joy. In his right hand there is happiness forever. And in Proverbs 3 verse 5 to 7, we find a sobering reminder. The message paraphrase reads, Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen to God's voice in everything that you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume you know it all. 
Do you find comfort in the knowledge that you were born in response to a predetermined plan of God, not as an afterthought? I'm pretty sure I do. We read in Psalm 139, 16, You saw me before I was born and scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. Before you even took one breath, every day, every step and every circumstance in your plan was recorded, customised for you by God. His plan for your life and what he wants you to achieve uses your strengths as well as your weaknesses. It accounts for our humanness. We all have strengths. They are part of the plan. We all have limitations. They too are part of the plan. We all have seasons of life that are essential to the plan as well. It follows that we need to identify and build on our strengths, accept our limitations as hedges of protection from God and yield to the seasons in life that he provides for us. God's plan for you is not a one-size-fits-all plan. Instead, it is customised just to your size. God will empower you to do what he calls you to do. With his customised plan comes every resource that we need to accomplish that plan. So how do we discover this plan and how do we know his will for our lives? The answer is simple. By spending time with the plan maker himself. By saturating daily life with his truth and continually turning our hearts to conversation with him. Not because we have a Bible study to teach or an invitation to speak, but simply because we love the sound of his voice and long for the ecstasy of his presence. When we spend time with him, the plan naturally unfolds and we take every next step in obedience. If you were to have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, and could ask him any question he wanted, what would it be? You might take a second to come up with the question, but I'm guessing that many would be asking, Lord, what would you like me to do in my life? That experience, that possibility, did materialise for Saul, and he asked that very question. He also received a response from the Lord. We read in Acts 9, verse 1 to 6, Saul was talking much about how he'd like to kill the followers of the Lord. He went to the head of the Jewish places of worship in the city of Damascus. Sorry, he asked for letters to be written to the Jewish places of worship in the city of Damascus. The letters were to say that if he found any men or women following the way of Christ, he may bring them to Jerusalem in chains. He went on his way until he came near Damascus. All at once he saw a light from heaven shining around him. He fell to the ground. Then he heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you working so hard against me? Saul answered, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, the one who you are working against. You hurt yourself by trying to hurt me. Saul was shaken and surprised, then said, What do you want me to do, Lord? The Lord said to him, get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what to do. In this passage, Saul asked two very important questions. Questions that we need sure answers to. Did you see what those questions are? The first, who are you, Lord? Verse 5. This is the most important question in all of life. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Your answer determines who you are and where you will spend eternity. Your Bible is the best resource for discovering who Jesus is. What is the next best source? Follow him. I might be a little biased in my opinion, but uh, I think that's a good way to see the character of Christ. Don't be afraid. Follow him's not dead. It'll be back in a few weeks. The second question. Lord... What do you want me to do? That's in verse 6. This is the second most important question in life. God's will and his will alone should be the heart's desire for every child of God. Even though you and I are such a small part of God's vast creation, 
and our lives seem very insignificant, God knows and loves each one of us. Even the very hairs in your head are numbered and known to him. As a result, he has designed a particular plan for your life and he has promised to reveal it to you and guide you into it. Before we get into know his will and plan for our lives, I want to address some myths concerning the, his plan for our lives. The first, God will give you a road map. God does not give road maps, instead he gives relationships. As you follow him, he will reveal his will to you. We can see this at work in the pillar of cloud and fire that led the children of Israel out of Egypt. We read in Exodus 13, 21, the Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud during the day to lead them on the way, and in the pillar of fire during the night to give them light so they could travel day and night. The next myth, God doesn't want you to have any fun. Put yourself in the place of God. How would you treat your children? Isn't he better than us? Luke 11 verse 11 to 13 reads, Would any of you fathers give your son a stone if he asked for bread? Or would you give a snake if he asked for a fish? Or if he asked for an egg, would you give him a small animal with a sting of poison? You are sinful and you know how to give good things to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The world implies that if you surrender to God's will, you will have a hard and unhappy life. Many are afraid to find his will because they are afraid of what they might be asked to do. The next myth. God only speaks to a few certain holy people. Knowledge of God's Sorry, knowledge of God's will for our lives is not limited to those with position. He doesn't just speak to the Dan Hanburys, the Terry Johnsons, the Spurgeons and the Grahams. He has a will for every believer at every conceivable level of commitment. If you choose to follow in his will, you will lead a closer relationship with him. He calls all of us where we are, both new to the faith and well established. The next myth. You have to wait on a Damascus Road experience. We read in 1 Kings 19, 11 to 12. So the angel said, Go and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And the Lord passed by. A strong wind tore through the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, the earth shook. But the Lord was not in the shaking of the earth. After the earth shook, a fire came, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came, a sound of gentle blowing. Saul's experience that we read of certainly was dramatic, but it wasn't normal. God spoke to Saul in the earthquake, but more often he speaks in the still, small voice of a gentle blowing. The next myth. God only reveals his will to the young. The truth is... God calls people of all ages. He never stops using his church. It's sobering to meditate on the fact that if we were here, sorry, if he were finished with you, he would have called you home. The fact that you're living today means that his plan is still at work and you are called to fulfill it. If you're sitting on the sidelines, I can guarantee that you need to seek his will. It's never too late to trust the will of God. A further myth. God's will is hidden from us and we have to find it ourselves. The truth is, God never hides his will but instead reveals it. He wants you to know his will so you can get about living, living it. This is not some sort of cosmic Easter egg hunt. Another myth. God's plan for our lives contains sinister elements. Isn't it comforting to know that someone much powerful than you, God himself, has a plan for your life. His plans for you and his desire to, to assist us to keep them uh, can only be described as good, as he says in Jeremiah 29, verse 11 to 13. It reads, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. 
The trials of the world put us at risk of thinking that God sat down one day and designed a sinister life plan for us, laced with pain and defeat. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reasons vary, but when faced with a difficult trial, many of us ask the same question, where is God in all of this? When the difficulties and heartaches are overwhelming, we often struggle to make sense of the situation. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13 reminds us that although our pain and trouble may seem pointless to us, God has a divine purpose for everything that he allows into our lives. Hard times and suffering come in every life, but we each have a choice regarding how to respond. If we are committed to learning and profiting from each trial, we will each grow in faith and wisdom. With these common misconceptions or myths regarding God's purpose for our lives out of the way, let's look more closely at how to discern his plan for our lives. The Lord is faithful to reveal the path of life to those who seek it. We read in Psalm 1611, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So then how do we discern God's plans for our lives? I would suggest that as a precondition to discovering God's plan for our lives, we need to firstly be willing to obey him. Too often we make plans, our plans, set them in motion and then call in God to bless them retrospectively. To genuinely do his will, we must put our will aside and be willing to do all that he asks of us. Can you honestly say, Whenever he le wherever he leads, I will go? If not, why should God reveal his will to us when he knows that we aren't going to do it anyway? Secondly, we need to surrender our will to God's. Many times when we say we are seeking God's will, we are actually wanting, what we are really wanting to say to God is, okay God, here's what I'm planning to do. Now I need you to approve this plan, all right? I must tell you that seeking ratification of your own desires is not really effective in finding God's true will. Before God will begin to reveal his will, we must be committed to doing whatever it is that he desires us to do. We read about this in Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Jesus was willing to die for us, so we should be willing to live for him. When we surrender to him, he really begins to direct our steps. The next precondition. If we want to know God's plan for our lives, we need to obey what we already know to be his will. Many seem to want to discern the will of God for their lives, but overlook that 98% of his will is already defined through his word. God is very clear about many, many aspects of his will. If we do not obey the things that God has already shown us to be his will, why would he reveal any further information regarding his plan for our lives? Obedience is an important first step in discovering his plans for our lives. We read in Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. This text reminds us that God's word holds the answers to all of life's questions. When you're in doubt concerning his will for your life, go back to the Bible and read. The Bible is God's primary way of addressing his followers. How blind we become when we reject following the light given to us. Here's a news flash for you. In case you're wondering, God is not going to mysteriously lead you to do something that contradicts his word. An important part of living as a Christian is to engage in self-reflection. Ask yourself these questions. How much of God's revealed word are you following now? 
Are you faithfully seeking him on a daily basis through Bible study and prayer? Are you active in ministry at church or sitting on the sidelines? Are you sharing your faith in all appropriate opportunities? Are you doing your best to live apart from sin? Are you seeking satisfaction in Christ rather than the world? These are just a few of the many areas where the Bible touches on our lives, where God's word is revealed to us in simple, concrete, direct instructions. We can't sit back and ignore the Bible and its teachings and yet hope to discover God's plan for our lives. Quite often, we as Christians try to blend our own sinful lifestyles with the teachings of scripture and we then wonder why we can't ever discover God's will. But ask yourself this, Although God does not expect us to be perfect, are you honestly living for him, seeking him, and doing your best to obey his commandments, such that you would truly obey his life plan? Next up, pay attention to how God has wired you. God has created you to to fill a specific role in this world. There is no one else who can achieve completely what God has created you to do. We read in 1 Peter 4.10, God has given each of you a gift. Use it to help each other. This will show God's loving favour. So when you seek to discover God's plan for your life, pay attention to how he has gifted you. His plan for you will always be directly related to the gifts that he has given. The great news is that you will automatically be good at what what he has planned for you. Further, Display a spirit of meekness, that is, be teachable. Psalm 25 verse 9, it reads, The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. If you aren't teachable and think you know it all already, then you'll probably never know his plan for your life. Further, seek godly input. Proverbs 11.14 reads, Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counsellors, there is safety. This is where most of us slip up, in my view. We live a lone range of Christianity and refuse to listen to the spiritual counsellors in our lives. I believe that God's plan for the Christian in this age is through the local church. Every believer should not only be part of a local church, but should voluntarily put himself under the accountability of that church. Now for young people, this might be a tough concept to follow. Why should I let a pastor or anyone else into my life? But the truth is this. The Bible talks over and over about the value of wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to make good decisions, spiritual decisions and God-honouring decisions. One key component of discovering God's will for your life is attaining godly wisdom and understanding. We read in Colossians 1 verse 9, I ask God that you may know what he wants you to do. I ask God to fill you with wisdom and understanding the Holy Spirit gives. Aside from personal time with God, wisdom, understanding and insight towards God's plan for our lives can be a Sorry, aside from personal time with God, wisdom, understanding and insight towards what God wants for our lives can be attained through seeking the input of godly advisors in your life. If you don't currently have three to four godly mentors, then I'd highly recommend that you seek some out straight away. Think of it this way. You should understand that you're basically a composite of the three to five people that you spend the most time with. It is vital that you choose those five people well. If you choose to set around yourself with godly advisors, they will be instrumental in helping you discern God's plan for your life. But if you surround yourself with people who are far from God, your hope of finding his best laid plans for your life will be greatly diminished. The church is designed to help you greatly with this. I encourage you to be in church every time the doors open. The more you involve yourself with a community of like-minded believers, such as this one, 
the greater your chances will be of finding godly men and women who can help you discern God's will for your lives. Next up, be open to God. Earnestly pray for his guidance. Report for duty. Don't wait to be drafted. Just show up and ask him if he has an assignment for you. If God isn't showing you anything, perhaps you should examine your life. See just how much time you really spend with him. Too often he is speaking, we are not listening. Getting back to the earlier encounter before, between Saul and the Lord in Acts 9, verse 8 to 9. As soon as Saul re- uh, received an instruction from God, he got busy following it. We too must not procrastinate. If all areas of your life are yielded and open to God's will, then you can expect that he will reveal himself to you. Are you willing to do his will regardless of the cost? We must also walk with God. For starters, if you're interested in knowing God's plan for your life, then you must learn to walk with him. You need to develop a relationship with him. Christianity is all about relationships rather than just religion. And so you must cultivate your relationship with God. You must seek to know him and not just know about him. You will cultivate that relationship by spending time in his word, taking time for prayer and taking every opportunity you can to to be involved in church and small group Bible study opportunities. When you seek these disciplines in your life, God will begin the first steps in revealing his plan to you. Next up, we must listen to his spirit. John 10:27 reads, My sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me. I think I experienced a major turning point in my own prayer life when I uh, learned to simply shut up while praying. That may sound odd to you, and it seemed odd to me at first, but see, I used to do all the talking when I prayed to God, but over time, I've realised the importance of taking time to listen to what God may have to say to me. Next up, listen to your heart. In addition to listening to God and his spirit, I also recommend listening to your heart. To understand my point here, consider the following passage. It's found in Psalms 37, verse 4 to 5. It reads, Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. I love this passage because it reminds me that when I'm walking with Jesus, he will enable me to do many of the things that I enjoy. When you're close to him, he shapes your desires so that you desire the things he has already called you to do. This means that God's plan becomes an exciting adventure. I always have the most fun in life when I'm doing God's will. And that is because he shapes my want, to want to do the things which he's actually created for me. The final step in discerning God's plan for your life is to assess your circumstances. God often clearly demonstrates his plan uh, for our lives by lining up circumstances in obvious ways. He also shows us what isn't his will in the same way. Over the years, I've discovered that a good metaphor to describe how God works to reveal his will is that for opening and closing doors. An account of God opening and closing doors to to his people in their lives can be found in Acts chapter 16. Take a look at this passage. It reads, Now when they had gone through Phygeria and the region of Galatia, they were forgiven by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So as you can see here, even Paul had to face closed doors in his life and ministry. 
God uses closed doors to show us what he does not want us to do. He also uses open doors to show us what he does want us to do. It's that simple. Those occurrences that are just too good to be true and not just lucky occurrences. It's funny, Christians routinely uh, blast atheists in atheism. We often act as if there is no God. We complain about the uncontrollable events of our lives as if we're just here by chance, left to sort it out on our own. But life isn't dog eat dog. God is in charge of this world. God is in charge of our little world. And the events that he allows, getting fired from a job, meeting a future life partner, getting rebuked by a pastor or Christian leader, the family we're born into, the town in which we live, the skill sets we have, talents and gifts we possess, are all part of God's design blueprint for our lives. So where does this leave us? Put simply, God has a big plan for your life and it's a good one. Do you know what it is? Perhaps you've never realised God's purpose for your life. As a Christian, you should live in such a way that your life will make an impact for God. Your attitudes and actions should count for his kingdom. If you do not God, know God's plan for your life, be meek, teachable, open and live in his presence. Listen for his leading voice in his word, his people and his spirit and he will reveal his will to you. We read in John 14, 21, those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Did you get that bit on the end? I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. If you know God's plan for your life, are you following it? If not, there is no time like the present to surrender and yield to do the will of God. It is imperative to remember that God is in control. There is only one true north for our lives and his name is Jesus. Making a poor decision doesn't mean we're forever out of reach of God's plan. That's part of the beauty of scripture. It has story after story of people who made bad decisions, but God still used them mightily. Just look at Abraham and David. They both did some things that were wrong, but God worked through them to accomplish great things. God can use all of our decisions, whether they're right, wrong, or neutral, to strengthen our faith and make us better disciples of Jesus. We also need to remember that God is our Father. God does not exist to condemn us, but to help us become more like Christ. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So ultimately, what am I saying? We just need to make ourselves right with God. Align our lives with God's will to be done because our will will ultimately fail. But God's plans, God's purpose for your life will prevail. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for taking an interest in our lives. Thank you for your promise of Jeremiah chapter 29 that you have good plans for our lives, to give each one of us a future and a hope. May we look to you wholeheartedly and implement the plans that you have for each one of us. Be with us until we next meet as your church. Amen.